signed up to LinkedIn for. I, I want the professional part of it rather yeah. than just short snippet of videos, which I can use on Facebook, not on LinkedIn. Mm. So anyway, um, are we ready to roll? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, and to another series of um, Dawn Network, um, Dawn Cast, and it's really great to have Andy True here. Currently, um, Andy is the um, presenter on Pop Asia. Yep, that's right. Being uh, you know going out there interviewing all those K-pop bands. So I'm sure there are lots of uh, K-pop followers out there. Um, so we're here with uh, he's joined us after a hard day sort of work. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, to talk about Andy Chu. Who's Andy Chu? And, oh. and, and, and um, <laughs> you know, how did you get into this space of, of um, you know, getting to present, um, you know, K-pop or Pop Asia for SBS? But first of all, tell us, who is Andy Chu? Well, um, I'm a boy from Canberra. <laughs> uh, I was born and bred there. Um, yeah, and uh, basically... Yeah, my parents immigrated here in the 80s and, uh, yes, started going to school in Canberra and then um, eventually moved to Sydney after university and pursued a media career. Actually, I started to pursue stunts, first of all, uh-huh. only because, like, martial arts was my hobby uh-huh. and I watched heaps of Jackie Chan films and I was like, oh... I'm going to be a Jackie Chan. Uh, I'm going to be a Jackie Chan. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my parents forced me to finish school and uh, finish university before I could pursue a creative endeavour. Yep. And then after that, I yeah went to Sydney and I scored a gig on a circus for a little bit. It was called uh, Shanghai Lady Killer, which was a, um, you know, a kung fu show, which was on stage uh, with wire work and heaps of stunts and stuff. And then... After that, I, I, I got a job on a kids' cooking program after a few auditions. So you um, got to practice. You got to do a bit of stunts, you know, doing some stunts. That's what you like to do yeah. so for, for a short time. Yeah. Uh, be, from training martial arts, I eventually competed. And then from competing in martial arts, I started choreographing scenes, you know, like choreographing kung fu. And uh, I was eventually given a job to choreograph on a few short projects, like short films, um, some plays. And then I met more people in the stunt industry who kind of gave me a go one day. They were like, hey, we're, we're shooting a Sony ad. Um, can we have you in as one of the ninjas? And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I want, I want to do that. And once I got on like my first commercial, I met more, say, professional people in the stunt world. Um, and they were really nice to offer me some more jobs. Um, I eventually got a gig on Wolverine. Oh, uh, did you? Yeah, Marvel's oh. Wolverine. Um, I was like, you know, a guy in that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could uh, we see uh, you? In Wolver- could we see you in Vol- Wolverine? I'm, I'm just like one of the guys ah, okay. that are attacking Hugh Jackman. But it was like a stunt thing, which was kind of cool. Um, I was also offered a gig on Tomorrow When the War Began, which was a movie back in 2009 now. Um, But I was a stunt guy on that, firing guns. Um, And then I worked on Hacksaw Ridge with, um, it's it's a Mel Gibson film. And that was all thanks to being in the stunt community community and Mm. meeting people that gave you a go. Yep. So being in the stunt community, you obviously would have had some level of martial arts and, you know, like, quite high wouldn't would you say or would experience yeah uh so before i entered the stunt industry i did compete in martial arts and i was lucky enough to win uh, say three australian championships um, so you're a black belt or blue belt whatever <laughs> <laughs> so at the time i thought uh, that looked good on my resume and so i used that you know to try and get more gigs i was like hey i've won a competition or two please have me on set please um <laughs> And then, yeah, eventually people gave me a go. Mm. Um, yeah, so from that, I started working on a... Uh, sorry, I got an agent um, from building a bit of a portfolio and I auditioned for a kid's cooking show as a kitchen ninja and I eventually got that job. And I thought that was only going to be a two- or three-week run, but it ended up being 495 episodes and seven years. Oh, <laughs> yeah, wow. so I was like, oh, well, I, I guess that changes my life. Um, so that really opened the door for me. Uh, it was a weekday program on Channel 9 at 4 p.m. Um, and, you know, it was like seven seasons and so many episodes. Uh, yeah, I was able to be on TV every day. And it's that 
was that where you wanted to be? Like, did you had imagine? Where did you imagine you were going to be when you well, finished high school? I I didn't know where I, was, I wanted to be. Actually, you know, um, in my dreams, I wanted to be Jackie Chan. <laughs> like, I wanted to be, you know, eventually in Hollywood or something, or making Jackie Chan kung fu films. I, I had no idea I was going to end up on a kids' cooking show doing martial arts, which is still pretty cool. Uh, but even now. Uh, see, doing that led to presenting at SBS and Foxtel and bits and pieces on ABC. I, I didn't know I was going to go that direction. It was just, I felt like the natural progression. Um, I was hungry like for work, as always, and I was just clinging on to any opportunity and opening any door that I could. I think over the years, being in the media industry, you meet a lot of people that inspire you. Uh, for example, uh, like Chris Lilly, for example, who's created his own shows uh, around his personality. Arne Doe, who's a great comedian, a great presenter, and has shows that are around his skills. And I've met a bunch of people at SBS that really inspire me, like um, people from The Feed, which is a really great show. And they do some great work. So once you get into that field, you're like, oh, honor, I, I aspire to do things like them. So I'd love to pursue the Kung Fu martial arts thing on the side, which is a part of the plan. Um, but uh, I also want to achieve a lot of things within SBS and the commercial networks. Because you're about to, um, um, there's a, a show on the 5th of August. Tell us about that. What it's called show? Street Smart. Street it's Smart, a yes. brand new sitcom on Channel 10, uh, which I'm very proud to be working on. It's uh, the first time a multicultural cast uh, on a commercial network. Mm. That's a uh, full comedy um, is going to be on TV, so we're really excited, which is Sunday, this Sunday, so which is August 5th, at 8pm, which is prime time. time we're yeah. pretty excited about that, yeah. The trailer or the, the synopsis was that is the un, um, this organised crime. Yeah, so w- w- yeah, we're a gang and then <laughs> we're just stupid criminals and we go out and, you know, commit disorganised crime. <laughs> Do you think, I mean, you know, obviously in, in the... in in the space that Dawn is in, we, we, we're very much championing diversity and inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we're talking about stereotyping, we're talking about unconscious bias. Often, I think that in the creative industry, in the, in the media industry, um, when it comes to telling a story or featuring a story about a person of non-English speaking background, mm. it often falls onto a, a stereotypical character. Um, what, what do you think about that? Do, do you think we have to go through that process to kind of have that stereotypical character before we get to be taken seriously as an actor or as a character, you know, in a film or in a play, etc.? Mm. It seems so. Mm. Um, I know that the American entertainment industry is a lot more, say, mature than the Australian um, industry in the way that um, their alliance or their SAG agreements have to have, uh, for example, a certain amount of coloured actors in a film. Uh, but I think the Australian ind- industry is coming round to that, which is great. Um, and originally, I, I was always cast as, you know, the tourist or the photographer or the Asian guy for the gangster, the doctor, I've done all that, the ninja, of course. <laughs> And that was my niche, actually, like the Kung Fu guy, because all Asians know Kung Fu. (laughs) But I guess if it wasn't for that stereotyping, I probably wouldn't get a job. (laughs) But I think I eventually, like, uh, clung on to presenting because I could be myself. Mm. Yeah, Mm. I could be more myself. And so I could do segments where, you know, I didn't have to be Asian to be in it. Um, Especially with this show as well, I think it's... There are elements that are quite stereotypical, but mm, at the same... No doubt with the you know, <laughs> disorganised crime. Yeah. <laughs> crime crime in Asian or crime in, 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 in ethnic is quite often, as you know, currently with the whole issue around the Sudanese in Melbourne. Yes. I yeah. Agree. yeah. So, you know, like how, how do you deal with the being cast as a stereotypical, like say the ninja, mm. being the ninja? Are you saying that it's okay? I mean... Do you accept that that's what you have to go through in order to be then taken into the next level of, of acting or, you know, role playing, but you have to go through that, that phase first? What's, you know, what's your thinking around that? 
I think everyone's journey is different, but for for my journey, I guess I have uh, been cast as that and um, have been going through that to start off with, but I didn't know any better. Um, But it seems like once you get into a position where you can create your own show, you have more creative power to do whatever you want. But I think, you know, if you didn't write it and you need that opportunity to meet the right people, then I guess you have to. Mm. Mm. What's, do you reflect on that? I mean, do you, as you, from the journey of being, you know, leaving Canberra to break into the acting world, but then kind of digress and become a, a stunt person, um, you talked about you had a lot of support in the stunt community. Um, do you think we should talk about diversity in, in that say in that space or do you think it just happened by osmosis like you know that people got you because you knew what to do rather than because you were Asian um um oh yeah I think it's it's depends on the project but there were definitely times where they got me because I'm Asian um and other times because I knew what to do Mm. um or I, I was skilled uh to do a particular task uh but I think there were times where I got jobs because I was Asian. I was, it was kind of like a completely white cast and they needed an Asian guy. And I was just like, all right, yeah. And times like that, I was like, okay, yeah, I, I like being Asian. Please stereotype me because if I was, say, a white person right now, I wouldn't get a job. Mm-hmm. There's mm-hmm. too many. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I guess it depends how you look at it. Mm. Mm. Do you do you reflect much upon it in terms of I mean where you are now I mean you're a presenter of Pop Asia, you can create your own show and you know you go out there and you interview people. Is it important for you um, the whole issue around diversity and inclusion? I mean I hate to use the, the two words you know but but how to um, include people into you know in, into um, the, things like media into things like the corporate sector to have it all reflecting what we have in our society is it something that you consider and you think about yes Mm. only because i mean for for many reasons one of them is it's part of sbs charter i mean like uh, everything that we do um has to go through an approval process and that's really big for sbs is diversity and inclusion uh which is great i mean from from my end, being Asian at SBS and in the media industry. Uh, but outside but of SBS, I mean, you're lucky, I suppose, l- lucky is that you are, in, as you said, in an, in an organisation that kind of have that charter. Mm. But what do you see of those that are your friends, you know, uh, in the entertainment industry? Mm. How diverse and inclusive is it? And should it be? Or does it need to be? It definitely needs to be. And I think it'll take time. Uh, But it also depends on what kind of journey you want to take. I mean, I think if you continue to say, just try go for castings for roles, um, maybe you'll still be cast as something similar for at least the next five to 10 years. But uh, more than ever, um, you know, Asian faces are getting on screen nowadays, like especially playing lead roles as well. And I think that's a sign of change. I mean, if you think about 10 years ago, that, that would never happen. And I think our time is definitely now mm-hmm. uh, with shows like uh, The Family Law and um, other shows like that. Um, yeah, It's it's still on, on, on SBS, though. It's not – you don't True. see it on – I mean, I would say the, the um, Street Smart, which mm. is what you're about to feature yeah. it in, is the, probably the first on a commercial channel. Um, yeah. What do you think? It's a slight stepping stone. I think, um, yeah, and but also reality TV is quite diverse, uh, mm. and I think that has kind of uh, because a lot of say Asian faces have gotten famous off reality TV shows like Dami Im um, and Adam Liao from MasterChef. I think they've paved the way a little bit as well um, on commercial networks. Mm. Mm. Um, so hopefully more in the future. Other people that have helped me were producers that. Um, for example, there was a producer on a Channel 9 show that really helped me out. Uh, only because I got cast in the role, then we became friends and then he helped me out. Um, and But if I didn't get cast as the Asian guy on this show, 
um, I wouldn't have gotten that help to continue. So I think, it, yeah, at the start, it, it, it is typecasting and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's tough like that. But once you build your connections and get into a position where you can potentially change things um, and, yeah, have more choices, then I think it gets better. What would your advice be to people who might, you know, who'd be watching this or listening to it, who, um, you know, might want, might like to get into the entertainment industry? What would your advice for them be in terms of how they actually can navigate through it? First of all, I'd say do your best to take control. And there's so many platforms where you can do that these days. For example, create a YouTube channel. YouTube show or channel, um, get on social media, like start creating videos for Facebook, Instagram or Twitter or even LinkedIn. Um, and also, yeah, take control and start networking as well. Go out and meet similar people. Start educating yourself either online or go take classes where you can meet people that are, say, on your level. Um, and do your best to find a mentor, like someone that believes in your skill set. Um, if you think that you have something different to offer, go out and find someone that believes in that and find your say your opposite for example if you are a director find a producer if you're an actor find a producer <laughs> if you're a writer find a producer <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah find your opposite and um, for example uh, a, a producer that I grew really close to he was say very introverted and I would say I'm more extroverted and so together we were a great team to help each other out and I think it's a matter of finding someone that compliments you. Um, I think that would really help. And most of all, work hard while you have energy, especially if you're, say, in your 20s or early 30s. While you have energy, uh, work harder than everybody else. Mm. Um, constantly pitch. For example, pitch doesn't mean always to go in front of a producer and pitch a show. Pitch can mean writing an email to someone that works in the industry and say, hey, can I make you coffee on your set or hey can I hold a boom and if you're doing that constantly like once a day um, you're going to start to build a really strong connection and so did you go out of your way to find a mentor or did you thought about having a mentor when you were in, in the early years when you started out in this path yeah uh, I didn't go out and find a mentor but a mentor eventually came around and I was like oh, oh can you be my mentor and that was a natural progression of just emailing out every day to say, hey, can I jump on a set? Um, hey, can I hold a boom? Um, so, so you started even from the smallest yeah, task. Yeah. yeah. So you're saying that, look, it doesn't matter what task um, in, that, in that area that you want to, to excel in, you just offer yourself, put yourself forward and try. In anything, yeah. Mm, mm. That, that was definitely my beginning uh, back in 2006. Um, I was just really hungry for work or to be on a set because I just thought it was so cool. I was like, oh, I'd rather spend my weekends sta standing, sitting on a set than being at home, you know. Um, so I constantly worked on school short films all the time. Even oh. I was from Canberra and I went up to Sydney to work on school short films. So I spent my own money to be on those sets. But eventually, over the years, these directors that were in schools became directors and then they, they give you calls back. And um, I think my journey from the first project I ever worked on till now being on SBS, there's, there's been a direct link. Mm. Mm. And what about your family? I mean, how did they see your like your career? Like, you know, you weren't you expected to be a doctor, or a lawyer, or, <laughs> or, or a pharmacist, or an accountant? Uh, my parents like don't talk about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> do they know? Do they know what you're oh, doing? Oh, definitely. Now they um, do, but my parents follow me on social media a lot, which. But back then, back in the, when you first started out, I I think, ooh, yeah, they. They were wondering what I was doing. Like, I was always out there. Um, I think they trusted. Well, I don't know. I don't know if they trusted. Um, I think they were following the journey with popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking, when will he fall? <laughs> <laughs> when is he going to make some money? <laughs> but did they think about when are you going to earn a decent income? They never, they never said it directly, yeah. I don't think. But now that you mention it, <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think. Yeah, I'm um, sure. 
but they knew I worked hard, um, and I think they know that today. So um, there was a moment where my my dad bought a TV uh, in his shop because he owns a business, and because um, the show, my my old show was on four o'clock weekdays. And uh, when he had customers come in, he would be like, oh, my son's on TV. What a coincidence. And that was a cool moment. Like, I was like, oh, I think my dad's proud of me for a little bit. Yeah. Because it's not typical that a lot of people of Asian background um, are into the entertainment industry. Yeah. There are very few, Mm. you know. Yeah, I also seek to validation from my parents a lot, uh, from my family. And I think that drove me to work a bit harder. Um, because my parents and probably many Asian parents are not very affectionate, or maybe they are. Uh, and so I, you know, really craved that from my parents uh, early in my career. So I worked really hard to try and get some ounce of like. <laughs> as in the like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or as in the like uh, hug? <laughs> um, not hug, we'll never do that. Yeah, just like, like, oh, okay, you're doing all right. Oh. <laughs> but... um. I, I did finish my, my commerce degree and um, I just knew I had a bit of a foundation. So that gave me more confidence to just go head on in this career. Mm. Mm. But without the degree, what would happen? I wonder if you didn't finish that degree and you just, you know, I mean, you, so there's still that a- aspect of Asian-ness, isn't it? That you have to complete your education no matter what. Yeah. Uh, they didn't force me, but... At the same time, I seeked that validation, so I wanted to finish it so they could be like, like. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so are you, do you feel validated now? I mean, do you think that they're now, you know, you're at the stage in your career or your life that, do you still seek that validation from your, from your parents? Uh, not be as, honest. Oh, I think I always will, but just not as much anymore. I mean, there were moments in my career where, for example, when my mum came on set for the first time and she was like, oh, wow, there's a live audience, there's a set, there's a camera. That was, that that felt like amazing, like an end of a chapter kind of thing. Mm. Um, And there were moments where I saw my brother and um, he saw the magnitude of our show and that was really validating. And after that, um, yeah, I kind of seeked it a bit less and just thought of new goals on how to work hard. (laughs) So what are the new goals? On how to work hard. <laughs> Just uh, finding good content, good stories, um, seeing other people's work and thinking, wow, like picturing yourself in their shoes and, you know, telling that story or creating that piece of work. That's pretty amazing. Mm. So, what, what do you think drives you? What's, what drives you? I'm pretty competitive, I'd say. So competition yeah loving that (laughs) um and being the underdog i'd say being asian in this industry you're always the underdog so yeah that's pretty good do you still see yourself as the underdog i mean you you you've kind of um done i I suppose very well and you've achieved a lot you know being a presenter of pop asia and um now i'd say being probably you know having a show uh, street smart as well on a commercial television um you know do do you think that um i feel i feel as if from listening your story you're part of the crowd you're not no longer have to try and fit in do you still think that you need to still and try to fit in into that crowd of in the entertainment industry and actors and all that stuff i i think there's a lot more pressure to stay in um, I, I, someone said something once like you've got to work hard to get in and three times as hard to stay in kind of thing right. and I think that's not saying that I'm completely in <laughs> uh, <laughs> what <but> is in? <laughs> I don't know it like, de- depends where you are <laughs> um, but I, I definitely feel I've got to, I'm working harder than I ever have to, to stay in um, to stay relevant um, to try create work that people will watch and uh, that inspires you too without getting burnt out. Um, so, yeah, I feel like the years ahead are going to be, you know, uh, potentially harder in a good way. Um, new mountains to climb, <laughs> a massive one. Uh, but, yeah. Where do you see yourself going? Uh, I mean, you know, um, do you see yourself still staying 
presenting Pop Asia with this opportunity at Channel 10, you know. I would, I've got goals, but I'm kind of scared to say them out. <laughs> say it. <laughs> Only because if you know. yeah, uh, it. But it's along the lines of um, what's ahead of me at, say, SBS. Um, so, um, yeah, along the lines of creating something new, something, yeah, that's around my skill set and also doing something for a commercial channel uh, around my skill set as well. And if I got those two shows up, plus um, taking SBS Pop Asia to, you know, another, another interesting level, that would be amazing. Um, so, yeah, I've just got internal goals um, at SBS. And, um, yeah, working on something bigger on a commercial network would be great. Mm. Yeah. Um, what do you... L- can you tell us about um, what's an exciting day for you? You know, in, in, in when you when you do Pop Asia, what's 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 it? What makes you live and breathe in terms of you know um, being a presenter in Pop Asia? What is it that kind of excites you? Gets you out of bed and jumping <laughs> for joy, <laughs> Andy. <laughs> Uh, being a presenter on Pop Asia is pretty awesome. It's actually pretty scary at the same time. Uh, for example, um, you get to interview massive pop stars, which is awesome, but there's always the pressure there that uh, you know you've got to do well. So you you do your best to stay calm. An exciting day at Pop Asia is when we like cover a massive band and when there's like ten thousand people out there and we're doing film. Uh, we're shooting the event, then we're hosting the event, and then we're running to different stages. Then we interview bands, and then we do radio segments, and then we do TV segments. And this is like whole day, a whole day. Then we fly down to Melbourne, and then we might do like a Chinese New Year thing. So it's a pretty exciting job. Um, especially when you're around really good people. Um, the Pop Asia team are really amazing. Um, so, yeah, that's really exciting. Mm. As to, what, yeah, what gets out, me out of bed is uh, the, f- the fear that it's all going to stop. <laughs> mm, the fear that's going to stop. Okay. Um, the fear that I might run out of energy one day. So now that I do have energy that I'm... In a place that I, I like, I'll, I'll do my best to just squeeze out all that energy until it's that's it. And then I'm like, all right, I'm done. I squeeze the orange juice and then that's <laughs> it. Left, it's just a peel and just a few kind of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what's what's the... That's the creative, Andy, True, That's the creative side. What is there... What's another side to Andy True? Like, wh- <laughs> what's the other side? I mean, uh, it sounds like this is just all you do, all you live for, and it's just... You know, this this creative part, like when you stop for a moment and if you do drink wine, which I, sh- I assume you do, yes, have a glass, of, <laughs> a sip of water. Mm. Is, is there any another part that you're passionate about? Mm. I, well, yeah, it's another creative thing. I really want to get a kung fu show up. Mm. Yeah, kung fu. Yeah, that's creative as well. But I like I really want to get one up. And that's definitely on the cards somewhere. Mm. Uh, but besides that, I, I think of, yeah, where I'm going to go in the next five, ten years a lot. Um, only because, yeah, I've got no one to, that's in, oh, actually, I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> go anywhere. Um, <laughs> Speak freely because yeah. we'll send it to you and then we'll edit the parts where you say, oh, no, can, I've thought about it. Can you not put that in? <laughs> Speak freely. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. I think outside of the creative work, I, I do feel... I think I'm very serious outside of work. Yeah? <laughs> a lot more serious than at work. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's thinking of a lot of logistics things about how to stay afloat um, over the next 10, 15 years. Um, I think about business a lot mm. um, and how to incorporate that uh, into our creative um, so yeah, so because you have got a commercial mm-hmm. degree background, mm. doesn't um, doesn't mean that it helps. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> it means I can read. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how do you build that business? I mean, that, you mean that's the other part of? I mean, like at the moment, obviously you're employed. Yes. Um, but you do also have an agent. Um, 
or I do have an agent for ads and stuff like that. But mm. um, yeah, I'm lucky enough to be at SBS. Yep. Oh, um, so that's quite good. But outside of SBS, I do pursue my own things. Mm. Uh, yeah. What, what are some of those things? Uh, lots of things. I I present. I I host. Um, I I do do other productions as well. Like uh, we do shoot some corporate videos and do. Um, you know, weddings and other stuff like that. And it's something that I haven't completely honed in yet. So I'd like to make that a bit more of a sustainable thing. Um, mm. Yeah. And just looking at other ventures at the moment. Because um, you were yeah. part of the Australian Vietnamese Youth Leadership Dialogue, which yeah. I was on the board. And and what was that journey like for you? I mean, you were selected because you were identified as, as one of the emerging leaders uh, Australia, em- Vietnam. Emerging weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> they needed like a creative person. They're like, oh, let's just choose this guy. <laughs> and, and, and how were you able to, um, you know, um, what, what project did you work on or what, 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 what was your idea for you to be um, s- selected for that? Um, honestly, I do think because I came from some weird industry, you know, they, they needed some weirdo guy and they picked me. Um, but what I got out of that was heaps of things. Like I met so many amazing people, especially smart people. It's great to hang around with smart people. You should do it. <laughs> yeah. But I, I did think it made me think about my future as, uh, as well. Um, they talked a lot about education and I definitely want to move into that space in the future. Mm-hmm. Um, if that's in regards to presenting, um, I do teach as well. At okay. the moment I teach at a school in Canberra called the Canberra Academy of Dramatic Art. And right. so I teach um, TV presenting, uh, the business of media and stage combat. And I am looking at expanding that into other things. Okay. Um, yeah. So doing a bit of a tour and teaching what I've learnt so over have, the years. My God. Mm. So, so do you have a time for yourself or do you just go from here, SBS, go down to Canberra, teach and come back to – like? So what's, where's your time to down to download or downtime? Uh, worse than me. <laughs> work is kind of like downtime, you know, I think. And I like doing it while I've got energy because mm. it does seem fine. And I know a lot of people uh, that are in normal corporate jobs, this is what they do in their spare time. So I think I'm lucky in that respect. Mm. But, yeah, besides that education, I do DJ. I started DJing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so myself and my old co-host at SBS Pop Asia, we're doing a tour around Australia. We're going to um, Adelaide November 23rd and we're doing Queensland next month. And I'm doing Brisbane, DJing Brisbane, doing Sydney later this year. Right. Um, so that's come out of being on Pop Asia, being a part of music, um, doing my own DJ tour, mm. which is good. And after getting to DJ... DJing, it's made me think about music. I was like, oh, maybe I should <laughs> release a song. <laughs> and, um, An album. <laughs> the person that I tour with, his name's Kevin Kim. He's an amazing, he's a K-pop star actually. Oh, and, right. Um, he's released four albums and um, he's got his new album coming out and just seeing his journey in that makes me think. I'm like, oh, maybe I can release a song. <laughs> <laughs> you better so, start writing it. <laughs> I'll just be one of those DJ guys <laughs> and someone would sing on top. Yeah, <laughs> that would be it. But yeah. So growing up in Canberra, believe it or not, there's more Asians than you think. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? And when you're Asian, you hang out with other Asians. <laughs> so growing up in Canberra, because there were, say, less than Sydney, it just meant that you all, you all hung out more. Right. <laughs> uh, but the coolest thing, I think the best thing about living in Canberra is not that many things come to Canberra, which makes you a lot more hungry. All yeah, right. so I feel that I wouldn't work as hard if I wasn't from Canberra. Like, nothing ever came. So if I if there was a short film that was in Sydney, I thought that was, like, the most amazing thing mm. in the world. And so I felt like I cherished things a bit more. And the Canberra community is strong where because nothing happens, everybody works together to try and make things happen. So... Um. Is uh, where does where does your creativity comes from? <laughs> <laughs> where does it come from? from? Is, that, is that your parents? Like, are they creative? Is it or something that you've learned from school? Um, I think um, just 
years of just being weird <laughs> and <laughs> people letting you be weird. weird. <coughs> so your parents let you be weird. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I think my, my, my work has allowed me to be weird because I know some of my friends who are like lawyers or bankers and stuff, they're, they're not allowed to be weird. <laughs> <laughs> and they, um, they really suppress their creativity. And so I go to work and just be strange, and that's like normal in the office. <laughs> yeah, but were you strange from the young age? Do you yeah. reckon? Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. I, All right, then. I think I suppressed a lot of the strangeness at an early age, but like once people gave me a door, yeah. I was like, oh, I'm gonna be weird. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna be so weird. Yeah. Now, your, your your parents came here as migrants in the eighties. You said, yeah. Uh, as part of, um, is it a, a a family reunion or is it part of the refugee exodus? Do you know yes. which one? Um, fam exodus. <laughs> <laughs> My dad and mom have different stories. So I'm like, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so did they escape Vietnam? Did they? I believe so. Did yeah. they stay in refugee camps? I think so. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You still don't know your history. No, I ask them all the time. <laughs> they're, they're like, yeah, we'll tell you one day. Or like, yeah. That's like, yeah. They, they, so you can you never get a straight answer. So, but, but you were born in Canberra. Yeah. Oh, that's probably the, that's the problem. That's, that's probably the problem. <laughs> Being yes. born in Canberra. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Um, do you know, like, does it bother you or does not bother? Not, not, that's not the right word. Does it matter to you? Like you walk in, you go for a job, either at commercial or SBS. Does it come to the, f- f- you know, front of your mind to say, hang on, like, you know, um, there are other dudes here that are, that are different to me or the, the dominant group and I'm kind of the minority group. Do you have that mindset or do you just go in and say, listen, I'm going to try out for this role and hopefully I like this role so much, I'm going to give my best and I'm going to go for that. And and if somebody got selected, not you, you walked away, you think, oh, well, next time. And you don't make it mean anything in the beginning i didn't think that not at all because i i didn't know better but later on i started to think that but at the same time i met a lot of actors that really thought about oh i'm not going to go for this role because it's so stereotypical and stuff like that which i always wondered "Eh, we don't get many opportunities anyway so i just went for them but i found that that hindered their performance a lot as well and that hindered I feel that would affect their career earlier on so yeah it is an issue but at the same time if you're going to pursue a creative career in Australia it's hard to do anything else like I guess you just have to go for it for now yeah but so yeah to answer your question it didn't really bother me that much so like as you said so if there was a stereotypical role that was offered you'd take it yeah, I'll definitely take it because there's more gold around that. For example, you take it and then you meet the producer and then you meet the director and then you meet all these different actors that could potentially work on your future project that could be more, you know, more better for diversity. Mm. And I think that's really important. There's so much more gold in that. Yeah. Do you see um, you've been in the industry long enough now? How long would you have said that you've been in? Uh, uh 10, 11 years? Yeah. So it's I try to cut it down because of the things I've done. Because <laughs> you don't want to be like, I've been in it 20 years and I've done three things. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in, in, that, in, that, in, that, in that 10 or so, oh, look, but that's, that's the reality is that, so where you are now, it, it's, not, it's not like you did it in a short time frame. It's been well, a long yeah. journey. Yeah, it's been a really long journey, yeah. You know, <laughs> so, so basically f- f- from my perspective, that's that's the whole you know when you when you hear stories of oh you know that person you know just entered you know the industry within two to three years of 10 years and they made it but in actual fact it's the work that they've done the the ground that they've laid for the last 20 years in Mm. all of the tiny small roles that that they have played to lead them to where they are yeah so i'm sure that's probably you know that's with that's been with uh, your situation as well yeah you know the, the tiny you know roles or whatever Ninja from the Ninja television show. Yeah. Was that 10 years ago? Uh, no, no, no. That was only about three or four years ago. Mm. But I did work on many other shows uh, that, yeah, for example, like I worked on just like guest roles like Rescue Special Ops and Channel 9 and Maximum Choppage. Um, but I don't know. I guess they're not as noteworthy. Sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, well, they weren't as big of a stepping stone. 
But you, did, I mean, um, did you learn something for yeah, those yeah, roles? Yeah, 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 hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and um, you know, could you tell us a little? Were there any really significant moments in those small roles that kind of um, you learned something quite um, profound or big that has kind of shaped you in your acting or in your pursuit of your career? Yes. Well, well actually, that, that's just kind of triggered another question, like things that I've learned over the years that I will not do again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number one is someone really important emailed me once, like really, really important on this show that I really wanted to be on. And then I was so excited that I got this email that I didn't reply. <laughs> 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 I didn't reply in time because, like, you don't know what to reply. I'm like, oh, oh, you know, like, oh, I'll save it till tomorrow. And, like, you know, it was just nerve wracking. And then by the time I got back to the person, they were like, I'm oh, sorry. No. The role's taken. Yeah. Oh, no, we don't want to deal with you, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I would say if there's an opportunity, find the courage to reply. And also, things that have helped me over the years is having a life coach. Um, a life coach to really plan out where you want to go in the next five years. That's been like really pivotal. Um, and yeah, having people on your team. So I feel like when you start in your creative journey, you don't think you have anyone. Mm. But the thing is you can. You can have a PT, you can have a life coach, you can have a mentor, you can pay people to be those. And it's just like a business. So a business has many things to make it work and I think you should think of yourself as the same. Mm. Mm. What's a PT? Personal trainer. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, okay. And I'm still fat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, Andy. <laughs> so you reckon we should not worry about, should we worry about diversity or inclusion? Because as you said, each of us can carve our own voice on online. Online, yeah. You don't need any. You don't need those big institutions anymore. Is that what you're kind of alluding to? They're still very, very important, but at the same time, it's not the end because online there's a whole world community that you can reach out to. So, I I know that there's been online influencers like Tina Young or Wenji who have who are the biggest YouTubers in Australia, and they're Asian Vietnamese, uh, and They've gone over to America as well just to, you know, bank it up. So I think the future is online. Like, yeah, you don't have to waste too much time on trying to pursue or... Mm. Um, I mean, sorry, saying that there's other avenues. Mm. So I do a martial art called Wushu, which is basically Kung Fu. Uh, but over the years, I did a combination of everything like mixed martial arts and did a bit of Taekwondo. But I primarily stuck to Kung Fu and weaponry and internal and external forms. Like we did things like Southern Fist or Eagle Form or Mantis. Uh, we did Tiger. We did Drunken Style. We did like Eight Extremities. We did Long Swords, Short Swords. We did you got to show uh, me some of these swords. moves later. Uh, tai Chi, a bit of that. Oh, yeah. Um, I loved that style only because it's what I watched when I was younger. Like when I was a kid, I saw lots of Kung Fu martial arts films and that really inspired me. I was like, wow, I can be a Kung Fu guy. Um, is that to save that, the world or is it just because of a physical fitness thing? I don't know. Oh, no, no, to save the world. <laughs> 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 and, and it made you look cool. I was like, oh, wow. Uh, but during that period of time, there was about five to eight years where I worked really, really hard in martial arts. And then after that, it was just about kind of maintaining. Uh, during that five to eight years, I competed and you know, traveled traveled around to train. Like I traveled to Japan to train with the Japanese team. I trained at the Shaolin Temple. I did that. Oh, the Shaolin Temple. Days, yeah. <gasps> and I just trained at different countries with different people. Wow. Um, yeah. What are the hardest things in media that I have to overcome? I would say pressure. Uh, there's always a pressure and a fear to keep going. Am I running out of energy? Um, I just put down my best idea. It did well, but tomorrow I've got to replicate that. Where is that idea going to come from? Like where? <laughs> <laughs> and once I get that idea, how do I execute that idea? Well, you know, I'm you know, trying to be a 
one man team with yeah so sometimes it's really really hard so um trying to do that while thinking about your side projects um how to stay sustainable uh, keep the energy there the drive uh, you use the right energy a lot the yeah, word it's energy mm. it's interesting is there why is there that fear that your energy would would go like what what where was that source of fear of losing your energy come from do you reckon yeah uh, in my early days i noticed that my energy was very high always because i had this strong um kind of a drive to keep going to to seek that validation from my family so i was like oh i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that you'll never stop me ever um and then i just noticed that you know slowly you know coming drifting down say in the last couple of years when you, you get that validation so like and you think of new goals but yeah just that yeah knowing that one day and even when you see like older people in the entertainment you know they don't try as hard well actually i don't know tom cruise does um, <laughs> yeah that's right so yeah just that fear that one day if you lose energy like that's it mm. that's it well is it it i, no, don't, know. I don't think so <laughs> well, without, well you've got to have a real purpose to stay in mm. i think because it's a lot of extra hours mm. yeah and everything takes time especially anything in media and entertainment i think takes a lot of time a lot of talking conversations and stuff so has anybody asked me where i'm from and where I'm, uh, my identity yes all the time and i think uh, that happens with every asian person in australia it's like the second question uh, how do I answer that? I'm saying, I always just joke about it. I say, I'm from Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you are. Yeah, I am. <laughs> but you I, were born there, born and bred in Canberra. I generally tell them, um, depending how I feel, I might say Korea. <laughs> 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 no, I'm actually from, yeah, I'm Vietnamese. But I feel that that's a connecting kind of conversation to have. Like, Because I ask people all the time, even when they're they're Asian or any any background, I'm always like, hey, so where are you from? Just a reason to try connect, like trying to find, you know, a level, you know, mm. something in common. So I always answer, yeah. I do say I'm Asian Australian. Um, actually, when I go back to Vietnam, I'm like Australian, but when I'm here, I'm like I'm Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to answer your question before, do I get offended when I'm getting? Uh, Asian role or something if I did I don't think I would make it very far yeah like if I didn't go for all the Asian roles like the doctor or whatever if you get offended by that earlier on I, you, yeah I don't think you'd get very far I watched the movie Yes Man <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, is that the Yes Man inspired you to get a, a life coach did it yeah I was just in that mode and she's like oh I'm a life coach you know I could coach you for six hundred dollars <laughs> and I was like oh man yes <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I did one session and after the first session you realize how important it is um, yeah. for example how important it is to talk to a friend about some of your issues even when you feel like you should keep it to yourself this time you're hiring someone to listen to you and put your puzzle together because they're basically mirroring you um, they're like oh you're saying this you're saying that which doesn't make sense so what are you saying and it's as simple as that and that's really important so it's basically just to train your mind up and uh, make sure you stay on track and naturally, like the gym, where you're going to get off track every couple of weeks. Like, you're going to eat junk food. Yep. And that's the same with your mind. Like, you're not going to follow your goals every week. And to have someone there to hold you accountable, it's, uh, it's really important. Especially if you pay them, because it makes you do it. And it helps you discover the type of person you are. And for me, I'm a obliger, which I've, you, know, you can do these tests online. Uh, which means that if someone sets a deadline, I'll get it done. If you don't set it, I won't get it done. I'll leave it to the last minute. And she identified that, and that's been life-changing. Mm. Mm. So it's a small price to pay for something that could potentially create you a lot more opportunities. And how would you have 
found the right life coach. Did you have to go through quite a few? Yeah, life- yeah. I tried heaps. Yeah. Or well, heaps meaning about four or five. But I went back to my very first one and we do pretty much a session every year. Yeah. Once a year now? Yeah, once a year we kind of set it up for the year. But there's been times in my career where, where I felt really down and when I thought I couldn't get over it, especially like during a breakup or something. And to know that she's there and I can pay her to listen to me and tell me what to do mm. is like, yeah, magic, yeah. Are you contributing to the fear of the Australian Correct. population by having too many Asian pop stars <laughs> on your show? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, how do you allay? How do you allay the fears that you're not going to cause any invasion? Well, you know what? Believe it or not, most of our audience is Australian. Yeah, it's not Asian. So we are promoting Asian pop culture to Aussies. Um, are so you talking about Anglo Aussies? Anglo Aussies. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, really? What's legit. What's the percentage of your uh, audience are, are, are white Australian? I would say over fifty. Yeah. Wow. Really? Yeah, so we're promoting Asians in a cool way. Younger demographic and and there's a lot of older people into it that won't admit that they're into it. So <laughs> <laughs> there's there's heaps of them. <laughs> and you know, their parents and stuff like that. So we're showing that Asians are cool and like you we're trendsetters. Um we have cool fashion, cool music and slick productions and I think that that's making Asians look cooler. So That Mm. makes me feel good. Mm. Uh, The only way you're going to figure out what the journey is is if you start trying and like trial and error. Mm. Yeah. Try and model someone a little bit and then figure it out yourself. (laughs) (laughs) Figure it out yourself, mate. (laughs) Don't come to me. (laughs) I've got Uh, no answers for you. (laughs) Yeah. But looking back, there's been some amazing journeys that have done really well, like um, Tina Young and Wenji who are on YouTube. Like no one would have thought they would explode and go on to do bigger and better things. So, Mm. yeah, who knows? Mm. Well, thank you very much. Um, So that's another one of our um, podcasts, Dawncast, with an amazing, funny... um, Team chats. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Chu. Uh, and, uh, you know, realistic, you know, re- uh, about what it's like to, um, you know, kind of cut it into the, in, or martial arts it into the um, kickstart into the industry of, of um, entertainment. So um, if you like us, subscribe to us and click on the link below. See you next time. Well, did you enjoy that episode of Dawncast? Well, I hope you did. At dawn, the difference is you. So hit the subscribe button below and leave a comment and tell us what you would like to hear more of in the future.